Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Learning to swim is a magical time in a child's life. The excitement of the water, playing with friends, making memories on vacations that will last a lifetime. British Swim School has locations throughout the U.S. where we specialize in teaching anyone to swim, from babies to adults, beginners to those who need a refresher. British Swim School's instructors make learning to swim fun with gentle teaching methods. Sign up your kids for swim lessons at BritishSwimSchool.com. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. As our listeners may recall, in 2019, Sage International Australia won a strategic policy grant from the Australian Department of Defence. Under the terms of this grant, we at SIA are to examine the strategic implications of changing dynamics and regional partnerships on major power competition in the Indo-Pacific. To this end, on February the 20th, myself and SIA's Senior Analyst International Security, David Olney, travel to Canberra to complete the field research we began last October. In this episode of Strategicon, we'll be discussing our trip to Canberra and our observations about how states, large, middle-sized and small, are positioning themselves in the Indo-Pacific region. Joining us in the studio is co-host and grant collaborator David Olney. Hello, David. Good morning, John. And our producer, Tim Whiffen. Hello, Tim. Thanks for having me, John. Before we start today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on the OzCast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. So, David, what are the key takeaways from our recent trip to Canberra? I've got a few ideas, but what about you? I think the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the sort of expanded understanding of multilateralism that I took away from the trip from talking to people from small countries who are in the midst of a transition toward being modern democracies versus talking to people from countries where they have been you know, long-term modern democracies, this different understanding of what multilateralism does and how they engage with it. So everyone can see the benefit of multilateralism. That is, you know, without saying, everyone wants to be a part of organisations that together can enhance stability and increase positive outcomes. The difference is if you've been involved in multilateral organisations for a long time and in a position of relative power, you have the opportunity to direct where the multilateral organisation is going. So the way I imagine this is one of those amazing early 19th century tea clippers, you know, sailing from India back to the UK. Massive big sailing ships moving fast. Probably the most complicated mechanical device ever made. Now, if you built that originally and you're sailing it, you get a lot of say, even though so many people and so many things are necessary to make that huge ship work. And it seems to me there is now a tension between the people who built multilateralism and have benefited from shaping it, directing it for decades, and those are entering now who realise there's just so many resources necessary just to be involved, but how do they make sure they're heard and they make sure they get something they want? You know, how in the end can you make an entire sail and have some say in where the ship goes? Or how could you make the rudder and have some say in where the ship goes? I think a more modern analogy there would be uh, JSF, a great international program, building a uh, complex jet fighter, and of course Australia produces things like flaps and brakes and but we have no overall direction of the program and, mm. and, and none of the participating countries except for the United States does because of IP restrictions and so on and so forth. We're part of the program and yet we have no say in it. Mm. I mean, I would go one step further and say that that's an excellent analogy. But is this also something that we have to get used to because bilateralism now is starting to replace multilateralism, that there is no confidence that large, medium-sized and small countries have 
in being able to influence these multilateral organisations, which arguably had their heyday in the 1990s and no longer seem to be having that much traction. I think that's an interesting distinction between long-term modern democracies and young modern democracies. Long-term modern democracies are very jaded about multilateralism because we keep putting the resources in. We put huge amounts of our you know, young graduates into government departments to go off and fill in forms and to continue to make sure the sailing ship keeps doing its thing. And I'm going to use the sailing ship analogy because I just like this image in my head of the big sails. <laughs> it's also not military. Right. And I like that in particular. Mm-hmm. And that sailing ship can be used for all sorts of things, for moving people, for moving goods, for exploring. It's got a better multi-role, less you know, in-your-face nasty mm. perspective. And I think I was really interested in the extent to which diplomats from smaller countries we talked to were so absolutely committed to multilateralism simply because they can see the benefits it has had and that is therefore at the moment still the best bet. Now, we talked about the language difference between states being connected or states being engaged. You know, multilateralism is everyone's connected, but there are still states who do more above that and become engaged. They, you know, they make things happen. They make sure that they are building a sail or are building the rudder. They go to that next level of engagement and of applying pressure and causing friction and making things happen. But they don't do that by exiting the multilateral world. You know, our suspicion was originally that that's what we were going to see, is that people get jack of multilateralism and move towards bilateralism. But I think this Indian idea of multi-alignment um, is a good way to make sense of this, and that is you'd be involved in everything and you just do what you need to do to get the deals you need to get to situate your country more effectively. So you're multilateral to the nth degree because you need to be involved. Because it is the big ship, it rises and falls with the waves. Or, or could you, could we say something else? Could we say that we are multi-aligned in a broader sense because that gives countries the freedom to either choose to adopt a multilateral framework or go bilateral or do both simultaneously, which is what I, what the sense I got in terms of you know how countries are positioning themselves. They're, they are casting that wide net. Mm. And this is where the, the sort of Indian phrase multi-alignment is so good. Mm. You know, it's still got the multi in it of multilateralism, but it's put alignment in of, no, no, you're not just part of the raft. You're not just part of the ship. Where are you looking for the specific deal to get benefit and how many places are you looking? So I, I think in a sense the, the phrase that India came up with is a great phrase because it says you don't surrender any available tool. You want to be part of what has historically worked, but you also want to push for new things that work. You will do the big and the small simultaneously, and if they cause friction or tension, you just deal with it. And I think this is the sophistication of so many small countries is that they know they need to engage at the multilateral level even though it is very costly in human and financial resources. But they also will make the deal, build the friendship, build the trade deal with any country that can help them to position themselves to become a modern successful democracy. One of the things that I notice in our interviews is that there is a hunger, a desire by the smaller countries in particular to be engaged, to be part of a broader community of nations. You touched on earlier about the sort of apathy about developed West. We're pretty jaded with things as, as they're currently structured. I suppose that explains a lot of the political problems we're currently faced here in Australia, the United States, Britain, with all these sort of moves toward sovereign capabilities, shall we say. And I think that at the moment what we are seeing is that we've got a bunch of small countries that have the hunger to be part of that broader community, but their hunger is no longer something that is a form of desperation. No, it's frustration. Uh, Yeah, it is. They are frustrated with the opportunities available through the traditional system. They're not going to opt out of the traditional system. I think this is the big change we've seen. This idea in the 90s that there were some countries like Eritrea who delinked, that you were either multilateral or you were delinked. That's now over. Mm. In my opinion, no one would be crazy enough anymore to delink if they had a choice. They will just do both now. So both is the new norm. Multilateralism as the safety net of what everyone does, but in reality it's too slow, and in a lot of cases it uses too many resources to not get big enough, fast enough gains. So it's do the multilateralism and get on with everything else you can build simultaneously. One of the things that I also noticed was, you know, the instrumentality of aid. Aid gets a pretty bad rap these days. I mean, we've always got governments 
clamoring to say that we're spending too much money on foreign aid programs. And in a sense, we're spending a lot of money on things that are not necessarily useful to the countries in question. No, we're maintaining the huge big sailing ship of multilateralism, accountability and transparency. And the reality is, in the 1990s, when we were still doing a lot of this with a lot of people, a lot less computers, a lot less technology, wasting this many resources to do the accountability and transparency was probably acceptable. And I'm not saying we need any less transparency and accountability, but transparency and accountability must use less resources because people won't tolerate the resources simply going in to maintenance of the machine anymore. But not that's only, not acceptable. It's anymore. not just the resources issue that's really at stake. It's the money issue that's at stake. A lot of countries do spend billions of dollars on their foreign aid programs with very little gain because in the end we know that corruption is a very real threat to foreign aid programs. As soon as money leaves a certain place, it goes to another place, not necessarily to the people that are in need. And yet we are now starting to see a drift in terms of certain countries wanting to promise not money but cap- capacity, stuff that can actually help local people develop capacities like mm. you know cre- the creation of biomass power plants you know mm. at a local level, which is much better than, say, for instance, building a road that wasn't really required mm. to begin with, but it was a really splashy program, mm. and it's something that governments can justify. Look, look at us. We've done this big program for you mm. know country X, and country X doesn't have anything other than dirt roads, so we built this huge four-way, six-way highway. No one's going to ever use it. Mm. What's the point of that? And if there's a cyclone, hurricane, or other natural disaster, mm. you know the thing is broken up, and we have to start all over again. So the whole cycle begins anew. I think we're going through a little bit of a sea change in terms of the way that we're starting to view aid And I think that from speaking to some of the smaller countries in particular, going back to the October trip, the notion that we're not good listeners, we in the West, you know, we have a preconceived Mm. idea of what countries require. We want you guys to be like us. Therefore, you need the big port, you need the big roads, you need the big bridges, you need all these splashy programs, and somehow that's going to give you development. Mm. And in actual fact, it doesn't give them resilience, and it certainly doesn't give them development, because they have no technical capacity to take care of these infrastructure programs once the big companies pack up and go home. So this is the thing, 1990s multilateralism tried to come up with a system that could just be rolled out everywhere, because wasn't it nice being in the system? Whereas this difference between connection and engagement comes in again here. Countries were connected through aid, but there's a transition now towards you have to genuinely engage with the people you would like to help. Go there, find out what they want and how to do it. You know, as we saw all over the place, people are setting up more diplomatic missions to be able to understand what's happening on the ground better to build genuine human-to-human relationship. So as we talked about with lots of people while we were there, the difference between soft power, hi, do you love my culture? And smart power, hi, how do we go about building a trusting relationship between our peoples? Soft power, as much as people waffle about it, in my opinion, is just underperforming. And smart power is still not properly understood. And, but and a lot again, of people are moving towards yeah. it very quickly. And, and again, you know, uh, earlier on the way into the studio, we were having a general conversation about the idea of strategic communication. I think that people fail to see soft power they see it as an active thing, and it's not mm. active at all. It's mm. just a passive, oh, here's my TV here's my program, culture. here's my culture, look at me, aren't yeah. I great? And it's like, no, that's not going to engage people. People aren't going to come to your rescue. Yeah. They're not going to actually watch the TV program and think any differently of you as a consequence of seeing someone on a beach doing weird things to other people. Yeah, it has did I to say be, that out loud? Yes, you did. <laughs> I don't know what we'll do with that. I think we'll just move on. You know, what we need to see is... In reality, thanks to digital technology being so you know, widespread, now, even if people have only got a 3G network in their country, there is still more information out there and therefore more access to other people's culture. That is not persuasive because that is not a relationship. Whereas what we really saw in both trips, but confirmed in the most recent trip, is the extent to which countries are trying to build government to government and people to people relationships and drawing the clear distinction that you don't just want government to government you want people to people because if people care about you your country your people broadly around the world then you can shine a much brighter light on hey we need assistance to achieve positive outcomes and that assistance does just have to be at a government level it can be students wanting to travel it can be people wanting to travel for eco tourism mm. it can be people wanting to travel to just live there for a year and learn and understand and learn the language. 
Well, you said, you know, Western aid often doesn't listen to the needs of the country that is, is receiving of the aid. If that government to government relationship is true, it's possibly because the government knows how much crap they spin. So why would they want to listen to another government? Yeah, but I think that's the listening cynical to thing we would say person. in the West. Yeah. But the more I started looking at this in terms of the nature of the multilateral organizations we use, mm. everything has to go through the lens of the multiple layers of transparency, accountability, committee structure, mm. system structure. Mm. So what starts as people gets morphed into a document mm. d- divorced from humanity and the experience of living on planet Earth. Yeah. Oh, well, everything is bureaucratized now. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, we need bureaucracy. It's not like we're saying we can do this without structure. But somehow in structures that have now run for so many decades, you know, we met a few diplomats who were absolute believers in multilateralism as it is. And the sense I got is the fact that the machine goes around smoothly is a proof that the machine achieves something. And that's what made me start to really question this. No, a machine simply going around, the flywheel turning, who cares? That's nice, but what's the machine achieving? Again, going back to my analogy of the big sailing ship, where's it going? What's it doing? Is it moving freight? Is it moving people? Is it exploring? Is it surveying, you know, the state of the ocean? Is it, you know, surveying the, the state of the shoreline? What's it doing? Just moving is not enough. Now, achieving multilateralism must have been an incredible achievement coming out of World War II and then through the decolonization process and through the end of the Cold War, just making multilateralism hold together and expand. Fantastic. Pat yourselves on the back, you made a machine, and the machine is somewhat useful, but, you know, like the difference between a petrol motor and a diesel motor, you know, big difference in the amount of energy wasted to get an outcome. Let's stop wasting energy and get more outcomes. That, I think, is the next big step. And if multilateralism can't step up and be more effective in its use of resources, this idea of multi-alignment, where you certainly don't pull out of the multilateralism, but you do get involved in everything else you can do, including people-to-people connections, better communication strategy, looking for more economic opportunities. All of this is happening at pace and, in a sense, outside of the town square of multilateralism. One of the things that struck me as interesting was threat perceptions in the Indo-Pacific. Now, in terms of security threats, you know, uh, the media has said quite clearly that, you know, obviously we have a lot to worry about with regard to the People's Republic of China. But only one state really expressed concerns about China's great international collaborator, Russia. Now, in terms of trying to sort of piece together what is the disruptive force in the Indo-Pacific, Russia does seem to have a much more marginal role. It's important in in terms of some countries because of geographic proximity, but it's certainly not something that, you know, Russia is not a country that keeps other other nations of the Indo-Pacific who are more, more geographically removed from it awake at night. Although, you know, there's this one particular state that did say that there is a, a sort of a Sino-Russian almost alliance being developed. I would argue that that's probably not the case. I think that what we're seeing at the moment is not an alliance. We, we're seeing opportunistic coordination to a great degree, mm. but, but Russia fears China in many ways more than the rest of the world fears China. And Russia fears China because Russia has this great well, I would expanse say of... <clears throat> well, no, I'd say fear because Russia has this huge expanse over, this, uh, over Siberia, which is gradually being, I wouldn't want to use the word colonized, but certainly settled by lots of undocumented arrivals from China which is a form of incursion that Russia doesn't really have any obvious responses to. It's not a military threat. Well, so it I'm, needs that economic activity. It does. It needs that to maintain. Why does the rail line work? Why is the highway maintained? Yeah, but, but the more is this goes any- on and the less Russians are actually on the ground to control the situation, obviously the balance of power between the two states are going to flip at some point. Yeah, and this is the thing, you know, to, to go back to the, the earlier bit, Russia really interposes itself so that it can be seen. If it doesn't interpose itself, it's almost like the majority of countries just go, shrug, Russia's out there. Now, I'm sure for Syrians, Russia's very significant. Sure. I'm sure for Venezuelans, Russia is very significant. Mm-hmm. And for the Venezuelan opposition, I'm quite sure they hate Russia. Mm-hmm. You know, To know that if it wasn't for Russian support, 
there's quite possibly there'd be a chance of things in Venezuela changing mm-hmm. and it moving on to a well, a path that may not destroy its people. Yeah. But in the long run, this idea of whether there is a genuine Russia Chinese alliance, um, you know, I think Peter W. Singer has a lot to answer for in Ghost Fleet of building up a definite military uh, alliance between them resulting in you know the war he hypothesizes in the mid 2030s mm. with Russia and China on the same side that was one perspective and it was a good way to wind up western elites who were asleep at the wheel in terms of you know the future threat of unconventional warfare they still are aren't they well <laughs> but look they've woken up screaming no, they haven't stopped screaming yet and whether they're doing anything constructive yet, that's a whole other issue. Mm. But at least they're now awake and screaming. They don't know why they're screaming. Mm. They won't for a while yet. <laughs> Not until they get their first cup of coffee. No. And I think this is the really <laughs> interesting thing with small countries mm. is they're very awake and very alert mm. and realised they've missed out on so much Yep. by being small, by being in transition, by still trying to get internal strife under control by not being able to leverage their own resources effectively, but instead historically being exploited. It's interesting, uh, just just on that point, you know, standard international relations th- theory, whatever the hell that is, you know, because there's so many different schools of thought on that. I mean, when you go and speak to practitioners in the diplomatic corps, you find, especially among the smaller countries, the countries that we would normally think are oppressed, repressed by you know, the big powers of the world, they are pushing back in ways that, you know, are surprising and actually quite enlightened ways too. The great takeaway from our from our two uh, field research trips at the moment is that, you know, no longer are the small countries prepared to just roll over for whatever whatever big ship comes along. I mean, and this isn't just an anti-American thing or a typical sort no, of anti-colonial thing. In they're not. No, no, no. They're all they're doing is they're trying to sort of. They've got a very clear sense of where they are in the Indo-Pacific. They have a very clear sense of themselves. They have a very clear sense of who's out there that they can leverage off. And I think that the key word here is leverage off. Mm. They will take American aid. They'll take Chinese aid. They'll take you know British aid. They'll take EU aid. They'll take whatever is offered them. But what they won't do is they won't accept other countries. Cultural imperialism. Co- yes. They have no appetite to lose identity in yeah. the process. You know, the very interesting thing with small countries is they can see the value of multilateralism, but not in the passive way of, well, we're part of it now and that's all we need to do. Mm. They want to get things done. They want to achieve outcomes. You know, their level of frustration at the pace at which things move and, well, the status quo is working for those who've been a part of these things for a long time. It's not working very well for countries who are now trying to get involved. So if there's enough pressure from enough small countries, what's really interesting is the way this pressure could coalesce. They don't want the same world. They don't want cultural uniformity. They don't even necessarily want economic uniformity. But they do want a more dynamic, engaged and just system. And interestingly, because it's these broad values of opportunities for, in Australian terms, a fair go that they're after... It's amazing how many small countries with radically different pasts might find common ground for working together to apply pressure at both a multilateral level but also at a multi-alignment level. I don't want to name countries, but I will name a particular region, the Latin American region. One of the things that surprised me was the level of sophistication and the desire for engagement in the Indo-Pacific in a way that kind of would befuddle most Australians because when we tend to look at the Pacific. We tend to have a very small P perspective about the Pacific. You know, it's just the South Pacific Island states. It's about dispensing aid to these countries. They better, well, just accept it because it comes from Australia. And we mean well because we know what they want. But again, you know, our version of the Indo-Pacific for the report that we're going to be preparing for the Department of Defense takes the much broader view, almost Japanese view in terms of... Yeah, this well, the, is the best definition. Exactly. And we'll run with the Japanese definition because it's the most extensive understanding we've found. Yeah, and, and at uh, least we don't have to invent it as two guys. No, indeed not. But the, the fact of the matter is that the Japanese uh, version of the Indo-Pacific extends to the east coast of Africa and the west coast of the Americas, which is really quite extensive and it's a very diverse community. But really, you know, in terms of just the sheer scale of how the region is and Australia's role in it, when speaking to, uh, 
other scholars here in the Australian community, it's it's surprising that while we may know that there is something much larger than our own definition of the Pacific, we're not grasping it. We're, we're not grasping it at an intellectual level, and I, th- I would argue we're not really grasping it at an organisational level as well. No, it, it's a real potential problem that you know, we had an interesting conversation with an ambassador where we were talking about landlocked countries, and he turned around with a chuckle and said, but there's also sea-locked countries. Correct, yeah. And we had this amazing penny drop of, oh, for so much of Australia's history since 1788, we really have conceived of ourselves as sea-locked. The ocean wasn't a highway to all these cool places. It was a barrier that meant we could just do our thing at home, thinking much like a land power. And we've got to get over feeling sea-locked. And when to our west is the dynamism of Africa really starting to transform, mm. you know, to our east is the dynamism of Latin America really starting to exercise, we want this future and we want to do it now. Why wouldn't we, while there is an opportunity for us to get over being sea-locked, and, and engage it, with both sides equally? And just for our listeners, our listeners may not be aware of the fact that there are a lot of Australian firms that are currently operating in the Latin American and African space. And growing all the time. Absolutely, you know, because these are resource-rich areas uh, and Australia's key capacity is to extract resources. And, of course, if anything ever goes wrong in any of these countries, guess who's going to be called upon to help evacuate Australian nationals out of places that we probably haven't heard of? So we need to be familiar and we need to be engaging. Yes. Because these are people who want to build these people-to-people bonds yeah. and want to engage. And we need to have that 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 yeah. a proper geographic map, that space in our head mm. that we know, okay, this is the Indo-Pacific, these are where the Australian interests are, these are the countries that are probably more fragile and will demand our attention at some point in the not-too-distant future because of either internal political mm. strife or you know state-on-state problems or whatever mm. it is. But if we don't have that, it becomes very difficult for the government to actually justify to the Australian people why we're going to be spending millions of dollars mobilising, you know, an evacuation from country what? You know, where's mm. that? And, and why is that important to Australia? Well, I think the other side of this is too that, you know, Australia's aspiration to be a middle power means we need to use what resources we have very effectively. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, a middle power is probably beyond what we have the will and resources to achieve. Well, is, but, just, just on that score, uh, David... Is it too ambitious for us to say that we're a middle power? You made mention of the fact that we, until recently, have considered ourselves a sea-locked power. And until recently, because now we're starting to build up a more maritime culture uh, from a military perspective. So actually, in many ways, uh, defence is leading the breakout because we're now starting to see ourselves as an island continent. For much of our history, including our colonial times, we were just one massive continent with a very army-focused... on the British Navy. Yeah, absolutely. The British Navy looked after us and we provided soldiers to Europe and the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, So now we're starting to develop a sense of ourselves. I mean, I wouldn't suspect that we're going to have massive organisation on strategic cultural change for at least another 25 years, but we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, we're certainly moving. But I think the big thing that I wanted to get to out of all of this is the way we're going to have the biggest impact is if we partner with people who want to be dynamic. And by people, I mean both the people who live in the States and their governments. In that this is a, you know, there's a hunger across the world, not just at government levels, but at people to people levels to be more engaged and connected and to make sure that this has positive outcomes. Public diplomacy is like foreign aid. It's one of those things that, you know, governments tend to get a rush to their head every so often and then they drop the ball. Yeah. They cut the programs. The the opportunities at the moment for us to use, you know, our resources, which by the standards of the United States or France or, or the United Kingdom, are limited. But those limited resources could go a long way if we partner with dynamic, motivated partners. And and yet, you know, when you say limited, okay, they're limited in a number of ways. But most importantly, in the public imagination, they're limited in terms of cash. How much money Mm. can we throw at country X over and above, say, you know, the United States or the EU Mm. or the People's Republic of China? Now, we we sort of discussed this quite uh, broadly when we were in Canberra. It's not really about the amount of money you throw at a problem. It's about what you can 
achieve at a practical level, at that local level, that will get you the people-to-people bonds. People will remember Australians for the biomass plant in the backyard that doesn't get blown over by, the, you know, the local no. cyclone or, you know, an earthquake comes through and destroys a bridge, but at least I've got electricity for my home. Yep. You know, that's what they're going to remember us for. They're not going to remember us for money that they'll never see no. because the local chief has just, yep. you know, bought himself a fleet of um well, it doesn't even matter Toyota's. if it's the local chief. The reality is if all that happens is it's a movement of money going through multilateral organisations down to the contracting phase, down to an international construction company, down to you know a project that brings in specialised labour and only trains a few locals, that is so unidentifiable as you know, who did that and why. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Whereas the more things we can do that are people-to-people capacity building, people-to-people support... Yeah, beginning with people-to-people socialisation mm. to build up a deeper understanding of who we're interacting with, what they're about, and how we can genuinely assist them to be who they want to be. Well, weirdly enough, one of the things that you know uh, strikes me as odd is the, the the entire Ramsey mission to the Solomon Islands. That was a, a key example, actually, uh, arguably Australia's only example where it used its sovereign heft to affect a country in crisis in a very positive and meaningful way to the locals, and yet we haven't been able to successfully follow up. And I mean, okay, no, Scott we can't Morrison's find got any evidence about the fact that this became the basis for a future strategy position. Yeah. We know how to do this. Yeah. How do we improve it? How do we make sure that that is now embedded in our permanent capabilities? So you know, Scott Morrison's uh, you know, uh, Pacific Step Up policy may very well be one of those great ideas, but in the end it will not be another Ramsey-style mission. So you know, failing to have that template upon which government can mobilise the the, the the necessary resources and the and 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 practical resources behind putting it forward, we end up with nothing again. We end up with well, money's wasted. We end up with what we've seen so much as we've been doing the research. Australia gets so many really amazing little wins. Mm. And the way we you know I've started describing it to people is it's almost like you've got a page with a heap of dots on it. Yeah. Now, if the dots were numbered, you could link them together and get a picture. Mm. But the problem is the dots aren't numbered. Yes, we have no so strategic narrative. So you've got a page yeah. with random dots. Exactly. And unless they're numbered and you can draw a picture out of it, there is no overarching strategy linking these successes together. Mm. So a success may spawn another success, or it may be an outlier that should grow, but then doesn't because it's not cohesively linked to anything. You know, discussions about Australian history... You you raised the issue, and I, I, I heartily concur, you're correct. Um, you raised the issue that Australia is a country based on fear and that fear is a great motivator. And, you know, when we say, when we talk about fear at an individual level, we worried about fear of failure. But there's also fear of success, you know. So even when it came to our real step up, like, for instance, the Ramsey uh, yeah. Solomon Islands. Well, let's assistance. go back to East Timor. How long was it before we handed the mission over? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, East Timor is an example of okay, here it is, our golden opportunity, and we walked away from it. We handed it over to the yep. UN. Now, that multilateral idea of the late 90s would suggest, yes, we would have wanted to make sure everyone was on board, and it was done under a UN aegis. Yep. But we didn't just put it under a UN aegis. We gave up on taking responsibility as the leader of the operation in the way we could have and probably should have yep. to encourage ourselves to be more confident in our competence. Well, which then leads me to the other regional issue that no one's talking about at all, which is kind of weird, but I suppose not really surprising when you think about you know, the way that we uh, see ourselves in the region, Bougainville and its independence. I mean, obviously, you know, Bougainville splitting off from Papua New Guinea is a problem for both Port Moresby and Canberra, and yet there's there's been really very well, little public... it's a problem de- for Port Moresby, and it's an opportunity for Australia to be positive and supportive to potentially both, you know, PNG... And a future separate Bougainville. Yeah. If we had a strategy. If we had a strategy. Precisely. <laughs> We're back to the dots. Now, Tim, a long time ago we cut you off. Yes, yes. I just want to ask, is it perhaps a good way to characterise it for the lay person that, for instance, we're talking about aid, so a charity isn't a bad analogy, that often we talk about the administration fees that, that a charity might charge. Yeah. So, and you know, only 70% of what you might donate ends mm. up actually going to the cause. You know, and then you know there are the smaller charities that you know they advertise. You know, ninety five percent of what you mm. donate will end up going to the cause. But often cases, it's better to donate to the bigger charity where only seventy percent goes because those thirty percent in administration fees 
sees that seventy percent go farther than the sees uh, that money get get put in the right places and used more effectively mm. to the point where it ends up being actually more effective, more charitable. Well, that's the more. Point. Yeah, we're after the effectiveness. Yeah, so seventy so percent of money, let's say, if you want to use that and, and being effective, is better than just throwing money at it. Isn't effective. Yeah. Yeah. So, so effectiveness more, is the key word. More administration, more resources, more management. We're not talking about just strictly money so people can afford their Toyota Camrys. Well, no, actually what they can afford is Toyota Land Cruisers because that's what you see all over the world yeah, yeah. So as the indication that someone funded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I always remember my first trip in, uh, to <laughs> Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and, you know, I looked out the window and there was just, just this row of absolutely beautiful, spotless Land Cruisers <laughs> with the UN written quite boldly on them. Yeah. <clears throat> and then in the evening when I... You know, as a private citizen, I went off to, you know, a couple of the local nightclubs and enjoyed the occasional touch and whatever with the locals. But I was looking at all these UN officials blowing wads of money. I mean, mm. they were like literally just... And you think to yourself, well, okay, you know, I'm seeing the UN at its worst because mm. those land cruisers should be nice and dirty because they've just come back from the field. And these guys were just parading around and, and having a presence. And having a presence is not the same as actually oh, helping Because people. having yeah. a presence says that's all we do. That's right. That's the problem. That's what we're kind of getting at. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, I'm not so bothered about having a presence. People having a drink and doing whatever. I'm more. I'm worried about the the four drives looking too clean. I don't yeah, care. I, what guess, they, yeah. I don't care what they do on their night off because yeah. you've got to pay them at a Western level, and the more money they put in the economy, that's better. Yeah. Well, to me, yeah, the vehicle issue is yeah. the key issue. Be, yeah. I'd be more worried if they were hoarding it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. but but then because of what I saw you could never really be sure that that wasn't the case. And because yeah. there's so many stories about graft and corruption taking place sure. in the sort of multilateral domain that is the UN yeah. or pretty much any other aid organisation, it makes one very cynical mm. when you look at these things mm. and you think, well, okay, you know, there's the altruistic mm. wish to do the right thing, but we also know that there are people who are trying to create their own little mini empires within these organisations mm. And you end up having blockages of aid. You end up having, you know, uh, massive projects being derailed yeah. entirely. Mm. And and we we can't just blame the UN and multilateral organisations. We see the same kind of um, process happening uh, with regard to how the nation building was taking place in post war Afghanistan and Iraq, where yeah. private contractors just came in, yep. you know, and and they did barely anything. I mean, and if they did do anything, it was not something that could be sustained. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that. Perhaps those things are sort of symptomatic of the fact that, you know, let's say Western aid just doesn't listen to where that to where aid should go, how aid should be, let's say, manufactured. Mm. So what we're saying is then perhaps that it's better to be seen to be giving aid than it is actually to be effective in aid. And does that mean that oh, that's a political problem yeah. just there? Okay. You nailed it. So the way that our local politicians can sell a multi billion dollar aid package mm. to a bunch of states is to say, look, we've just created a bridge here. Now, what wouldn't be as media enticing is, look, we've just created a bunch of biomass which will allow this particular village to literally be off the grid mm. and have electricity mm. irrespective of what natural disaster comes their way. Mm -hmm. That is something that you can't put on the front page and start, you know, running around mm. and saying, look at this, look look how well our aid is being dispensed. Yes. Um, and, and I think that this so, raises... Oh, sorry, go on. No, that's okay. Well, yeah. if that's the case, mm. uh, if it's kind of, let's say, let's say it's, it is better, it's more of an image thing, mm. then, you know, you guys are making an argument that we have to actually be effective. Clearly, what what we actually want from aid isn't necessarily to be effective because unless that would be happening. If, so you guys need to make an argument, I guess, to say what is it Australia can get out of this by being effective in aid because clearly they're doing it well, regardless. Because people to people of ties. being effective, you develop yeah. people to people ties, you yeah. enhance your smart power. Right. Exactly. You okay. guarantee a proper Influence. relationship mm. over time. Look Which they didn't have before. Influence no. wasn't the point before. Well, influence is the point. But, you know, when you come in with a sort of um, an attitudinal problem, like, mm. for instance, well, I'm the rich guy. Influence. That's right. Because right. influence is saying, look, if we do this, we yeah. both win. Right. Okay. Power is saying we're going to bloody well do this and you'll tolerate it. Right. Yes. So we're looking for the and plus sum game. it's about power. And it's a humility, Not really. Mm. Yeah. And the plus sum game is the thing where everyone actually wins and walks away with something that they want. Mm. Whereas the power game is what we've been historically lumbered involved with. in. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and which leads us to another thing, and that is the um, the, the success and penetration of uh, Chinese 
uh, influence in the South Pacific. You know, one of the things that really keeps a lot of uh, security practitioners in Canberra awake at night. Um, and and again, you know, when when speaking to some of the small countries, you get a sense that it's not a problem for them because they are actually in control of whether or not they want to get this done. And if they do want to get it done, it'll be on their terms. Whereas when you hear the media stories about Chinese investment in the region, it's like China is just like literally buying up the South Pacific. Yeah, but we're thinking in terms of power. Yes, we are. So we think if the Chinese spend money on a small island, they now own it. Yep. Whereas a small island is going, really? Yep. Do you remember what the colonial powers were like? Yep. <laughs> and, and, and how far away are you from here? You, you can't literally take the island state and take it to China. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? <laughs> You know, you're going to have to actually garrison this place. That's going to come at a cost to you if you want to go down that path. And if you garrison, and we will resist. Yeah, and and this is the thing: the world is really good at resistance. Mm, mm. Most of the developing world kicked out imperial powers, and they will continue and to made do so. The cost so damn high yep. that most of the imperial powers at the end of World War Two went home with their tails between their legs. And this is a there's a historic lesson here that we are not very good at actually. Uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing into our uh, focus, especially from a policymaking perspective, it's easy to get mm. excited by the latest bad news media story about, you know, China's capacities to influence people because of brown paper bags being traded between officials. And in actual fact, it's really not like that. It's a far, far more complex uh, system. And, and the Chinese will find out if they try to overstep their reach that the local people will push back in a way that's going to not be in their interest. Uh, death of a thousand cuts. Yep. So we're all worried about it boiling over, let's say, but it's actually probably going to stay at a, a nice warm 55 degrees. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> the frog's just going to be a bit uncomfortable yeah, in the pot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> he won't quite be a cooked frog. Be beyond, gee, it's just a bit warm. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, I think that that's a pretty good summary of our trip and the main themes that we... We managed to get David. What do you think? Is there anything else you'd like to? I think that's all the key things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you both very much. Uh, it's been awesome to listen to you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through the Ozcast Network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. Traditionally, Toys for Tots has been a Christmas time charity. In recent years, the program has evolved into a year round force for good by distributing toys, games, and books to children in need throughout the year. Last year, during their 75th anniversary, the program distributed over 24 million toys to nearly 10 million less fortunate children and provided over 6.3 million books to children in need through their literacy program. Visit toysfortots.org to support their mission. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.